Good morning and welcome to the 26th annual African African American Caribbean Studies Summer Institute. My name is Dr. Patrick Williams and I'll be conducting this session on multiple intelligences. Well, I've been teaching for 31 years in Miami-Dade County Public Schools. I've taught at many universities, both here and abroad, especially in South Korea at Busan University. I was also a Fulbright Scholar, Memorial Scholar to Japan. I've also became a federal court interpreter for the United States. I speak seven languages, I sing operas, and I'm a classical pianist. So today is a very interesting day, given that we're here on this coronavirus lockdown and we have to do this via some virtual means. So bear with me as I maneuver myself through this. So what is this about multiple intelligences that is so interesting and why I think we should adapt to it? So I'm gonna give you a sort of an overview as to where my take is and how I'm gonna approach this workshop. So I believe that teaching and learning often refers to the monopoly of interactions between students and teachers that help students to master subject matter, sharpen their critical thinking, and develop personally and intellectually. While teaching and learning is frequently associated with inquiry, pedagogy, and educational theory, a new thematic catalyst focusing on the learner's cultural background, learning styles, and preferences is rapidly emerging in academic research. Most, but not all, of the issues related to teaching minority students are the same as teaching majority students. The traditional and highly prevalent instructional model of the omniscient teacher, the all-knowing teacher, lecturing to sort of passive students, busily taking notes, that is losing ground, but has by no means disappeared. Active involvement, frequent feedback, and understanding of different ways of learning are some of the known ways to increase students' learning. Most educators, as you guys are, agree that students approach learning in many different ways and that teachers can take these differences into account in developing instructional strategies that accurately addresses student needs. Research in teaching and learning is abundant. Ironically, little has been deliberately or has been deliberately or systematically incorporated by the instructional community. So many of the points addressed here in this workshop will be obvious to many of you participants who are knowledgeable about instructional and learning theories. For others whose disciplinary interests do not take you into this realm, the ideas presented here will be newer. So I wanna start off with this congruent communication message that says, teachers who want to improve relations with children need to unlearn their habitual language of rejection and acquire a new language of acceptance. To reach a child's mind, a teacher must first capture his or her heart. Only if a child feels right can he or she think right. And I want you to ponder on this for a little bit and tell me what do you think this message is saying? Why do I need to capture the child's heart? Obviously, I'm here just to teach. I'm here to teach, get that paycheck, and go home. Why should I care about a child's heart? Only if he feels right can he or she think right. But this is a very poignant statement and it's a very true statement because we know and we've heard this before that a child doesn't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So before we can begin to implement this multiple intelligence in our classroom, I want to share with you what it is to become a, that multicultural teacher. So becoming that multicultural teacher, I use this word multicultural, and here I embody the knowledge base that I think will embrace what is a multicultural teacher. And it starts with the letter M in multicultural. Become that multicultural person. And this is one who is open-minded, knowledgeable, sensitive, and tolerant. The U in multicultural, use of idioms, and cliches. We need to be aware and mindful of racial slurs. 
Yes, the L in multicultural. We need to look for bicultural moments. Take advantage of every opportunity we have to present culture in our classroom. T, time concept. Various cultures view time differently. And in the native Lakota language, there isn't even a word for time. I, in multicultural, instill pride in ethnic heritage. Give students opportunities to share their culture. Putting on a cultural fair allows students to learn more about their culture and the culture of their classmates. C, and this is very important, we have to confront our own racism. Understanding that prejudice can lead to a more accepting attitude. And as teachers, we give up the right to be biased. The U, understanding different perspectives. Hispanic considers family to be number one priority, even before education. Therefore, students may stay home from school to take care of younger siblings. And if Abuela comes from Cuba last week, they're going to stay home to celebrate Abuela being here in the United States. Uh, so look for those things. The L in multicultural. Look for the positive. High self-esteem usually means tolerance for differences. T, teach tolerance. Understanding one own culture makes it easier to appreciate others. The U, understand deep culture. Yes, at the underlying, look at the underlying cultural beliefs that are exhibited in behavior. And R, which I think is another important one, read about other cultures. Prejudice is reduced by knowledge because we can't teach what we don't know. A, appreciate diversity. And as teachers, we set the example. And L, in multicultural, learning styles, which brings us to our topic today. We need to vary our teaching strategies to meet the needs of individual students. Look into Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence theory to find that students can be smart in a variety of ways. And so what are some of the drawbacks to us becoming or to someone becoming this multicultural teacher or adapting to this new kind of way of teaching or involving multicultural multiple intelligence in his or her classroom? And we have a problem that we say it's what we call the egocentric thinking. And this is taken from the ministry guy by Richard Paul. And he says that egocentric thinking comes from the unfortunate fact that as humans, do not naturally consider the rights and needs of others. And here he goes on to give a list of some of the common psychological standards in human thinking. We have innate egocentrism. It's true because I believe it. I assume that what I believe is true, even though I have never questioned the basis of many of my beliefs. Innate sociocentrism. It's true because we believe it. I assume that the dominant beliefs within my group to which I belong are true, even though I have never questioned the basis of many of my beliefs. Innate wish fulfillment. It's true because I want to believe it. I believe in, for example, accounts of behavior that put me in a positive rather than a negative light, even though I have not seriously considered the evidence for the more negative account. Innate self-validation. It's true because I have always believed it. I have a strong desire to maintain beliefs that I have long held, even though I have not seriously considered the extent to which those beliefs are justified, given the evidence. And the last one here we have is innate selfishness. It's true because it is in my selfish interest to believe it. And we have other things here that we can look at, our belief cycle action. And this was taken from the model of how people operate in the business world. So if you have a belief that is, it's not my issue. I'm already working too hard. I'm burned out. I, I should not stick my neck out. Then that belief will lead to this action where we stick to the status quo and we do not initiate new solution. And sometimes we may discourage other team members from taking the initiative to do better in the classroom. And the results would be, oh, it takes more work to maintain current productivity, i.e. students' uh, achievement, and the results may suffer. Senior management or administration applies pressure to improve the results. Nothing changes. 
But if we have a belief cycle that is of a positive role, where I believe that I can fix this, we will save time, something must change to produce different results. This is why I'm here. Then that belief or those beliefs will follow the actions of opening up to new ideas. Team members encourage to think. Team members are encouraged to offer ideas and the results will be phenomenal because problems will get resolved. Failures are quickly reworked. The administration will work. Work is fruitful and meaningful and opportunities are recognized and sees. So what are the multiple intelligences that we're gonna to discuss today? And originally Howard Garner talked about seven multiple intelligences and then it became eight, eight with the naturalists. And then now there's nine, which we have involved also the existentialists. So a look at the eight traditional multiple intelligences here. And we have traditional ones, which every school has, the verbal linguistic, which is language arts, and the mathematical logical, which is mathematics. Arts and music, visual spatial, musical rhythmic. Outdoor intelligences, bodily kinesthetic, PE, naturalist, science, and the personal intelligences, which are interpersonal and intrapersonals. So a few notes here on this, and I'll just paraphrase here, that philosophies consistent with multiple intelligences emphasize that people have diverse abilities or ways of learning and different ways of demonstrating them. So this idea of intelligence, and I always ask the question, those who are intelligent, raise your hand. And I would get a few students to raise their hands. And I ask why? Because somehow we feel as though being intelligent is tied to academic prowess. Having a high GPA or scoring good on tests is a sign of intelligence. But what good is a PhD if you throw me in the wilderness or in the woods and I cannot survive, I don't know how to cut wood, I don't know how to make fire, then my intelligence and my PhD serves no purpose, yes? So we have to look at how we can ascribe to these theories of intelligences. So let's look, take a look deeper at some of the domains of intelligences. So here we have the word smart, and this is the linguistic learner. And this person likes to read, write, tell stories, give speeches, excels at memorizing trivia, writing, and learn best by, and you see these things they're reading, writing, speaking. We have the mathematical logical learner, and this is the number smart person, the questioner, if you will. This person likes to do experiments, figure things out, work with numbers, ask questions, analyze and make predictions. They excel at mathematics, reasoning, logic, problem solving. Yes, and I'm sure you know that these skills extend outside of the field of mathematics. And they learn best by categorizing, classifying, working with abstract patterns and relationships. The picture smart person or the spatial learner, visual spatial, likes to draw, build, design, daydream, if you will, view pictures and movies and use and see colors. The music smart person or the music lover is the person that likes to sing and hum and listens to music, may play an instrument, collect CDs, and they excel at picking up sounds, remembering melodies, singing songs. The body smart person or the bodily kinesthetic person this person likes to move around. And who doesn't like to move around in the classroom? How do we expect students to sit for a two hour or an hour and a half lecture in their seat without actually moving? So I'm gonna show you how it's in, incumbent upon us to incorporate bodily kinesthetic in our classroom. This person likes to move around, as we say, uh, use gestures frequently excels at physical activities, sports, craft, drama, acting, mechanics, and they learn best by doing, moving, role-playing, and hands-on experiences. The interpersonal learner, which is the people person. This person likes to solve problems, just as the mathematical logical. They like to talk to people. They like to join groups. They like to have lots of friends. They excel at understanding people and they learn best by working in a group. 
communicating, debating. Next, we have the intrapersonal learner or the individual. This person likes to work independently, pursue his or her own interests, and have strong opinions. So they excel at understanding self, focusing inward on feelings, being original, and they learn best by individualized project, self-paced instruction, reflecting, thinking, and visualizing independently. And last, we have the naturalist learner. This is the nature lover. This person likes to garden, hike, spends more time outdoors, excels at collecting, categorizing. Yes, and you can see how some of these skills that they excel at also coincide with other domains of intelligence. They learn best by classifying, organizing, observing, and doing experiments. So, how can we use this areas of strength in the classroom? And what are some of the who are some of the famous examples of each of these intelligence? And I think if we show students that they're not alone in embodying these intelligences, they can, they can build their self-esteem and they will feel better about themselves. So here we have on the linguistic, again, re-emphasizing what we just went over, what they're strong at, what they like, how best they learn. Some famous examples of this is T.S. Eliot, Maya Angelou, Abram Lincoln. And what are some of the common misbehaviors that go along with these intelligences? Mathematical logical, Albert Einstein, John Dewey, working on math and building things during lesson. Spatial, Pablo Picasso, dueling or drawing or daydreaming, bodily kinesthetic, Charlie Chaplin, Michael Jordan, fidgeting, wandering around the room, musical, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Ella Fitzgerald. They have a tendency to tap pencil or knocking their feet on the ground. Interpersonal, Mahatma Gandhi, Ronald Reagan, Mother Teresa, t talking or passing notes. Interpersonal, Eleanor Roosevelt, Sigmund Freud, Thomas Merton, conflicting with others. The naturalists, for example, uh, John James, Audubon, Roger Tory Peterson, and Charles Darwin. And some common misbehaviors here, we have staring out the window, skipping school to go fishing or hunting. So we see some of the common mistakes here, uh, misbehaviors rather, that are there with students of all different learning styles and all different learning types. So right now, we're gonna take a few minutes and do an activity, which we, I call the human intelligence hunt. And on this, you will get this sheet of paper here and you will get up, you'll move around and you'll start asking a friend or someone in the room who can. So your job is to find someone in this room who can do one of the following. And usually you should only have one, the person sign your paper once. So who can whistle a few notes from old MacDonald? Who can stand on one foot with eyes closed for five seconds? Recite at least four lines from any poem. Draw a quick diagram explaining how an electric motor works. Complete the numerical sequence, 36, 30, 24, 18, and explain the logic behind it. And who can honestly say that he or she is relaxed and comfortable relating to other people during this exercise? So you'll take a few minutes to do that. Now, after that, we will convene together and we'll discuss the findings of this little intelligence hunt. Now, how do we arrive at the student's strength? And I found this assessment here. Uh, this form can help you determine which intelligences are strongest for you. If you're a teacher or tutor, you can also use it to find out which intelligence your learner uses most often. And we're gonna thank uh, Dr. Terry Armstrong for allowing me to use this questionnaire. So this is what the questionnaire sort of looks like. This is just a preview. But if you click this link here, literacyworks.org forward slash mi forward slash assessment forward slash find your strength it will take you to this page where you will see and you can fill out the form so what happens when you finish the assessment what does it look like you will get something looking like this it will list your top three intelligences and it will tell you for in this case it's math logical 4.71 
and it tells you what you like, and it gives you some categorical terminologies here about what those mean. Second was bodily kinesthetic or body movement, yes? Now also within the multiple intelligence, we have some eminent individuals from minority cultures. And I think this is very important that students of color as well as all students should know eminent individuals of minority cultures who are high linguistic or are highly intelligent in each of the seven or eight uh, multiple intelligences here. So for mathematical logical, we have Carver, African-American, Asian, Wang Li, Latino-American, Luis Alvarez. We have here Jackie Jonah Kersey. We have Christy Yamaguchi. We have uh, Juan Maria, Maria, Maria Chal. Uh, high musical intelligence, we have Midori. We have Linda Ronstadt, Latina. We have Scott Joplin, interpersonal, Martin Luther King. Xavier Suarez, we have here Black Elk, Native Indian, Native American, sorry, Cesar Chavez, and we have Malcolm X. Here are some high individuals also with disabilities that embody the seven or eight multiple intelligences. Agatha Christie, Albert Einstein, these are people that we know, famous people. They had some learning disabilities, Stephen Hawking, and it's, I think if students see this, they will come to some term with themselves to say, wow, what I'm going through or what I have is a disability, maybe not a disability, and it won't impede me from learning or succeeding in school. Musical, Sergei Rachmaninoff, Ravel, Isaac Perlman, yes, Ludwig van Beethoven, HI, that means he's hearing impaired, learning disabled, General George Patton, Aristotle, CD, communicative disorder, yes? And we have many of these students in our classrooms right now. They're just not famous yet, but they're there, okay? All right, so why the need to have the multiple intelligence in our classroom, why? And here, there was an analysis done, and thanks to the Teal Inventory for Multiple Intelligence, this analysis was done with over 6,000 answer sheets and it revealed some data that in indicated we may want to examine this whole idea of multiple intelligence further. The mean scores demonstrate that at the primary level and you can see right here at the primary level of 4.09, 4.05 for both mathematical and logical intelligences the mean scores demonstrate at the primary level for both male and female students are interested in linguistic and mathematical logical intelligence. But as they advance to the upper grades, that interest declines. So as you see, they go through upper grades, the middle school and now high school, it's now a 2.7 or 2.86, so it declines, yes? Based on the results of this inventory, the older the students become, the less they prefer to learn in those two ways, which remember we talked about are the traditional models in the classroom, mathematical, logical, and linguistic. So based on this inventory, the older the students become, the less they prefer to learn in those two ways, and the more they desire active, interpersonal, and visual ways of learning. So here, as you look, you see intrapersonal, interpersonal. It's a 3.39, 3.93. And as they go, it goes up here. So we say where it's active interpersonal, see how it goes up. Musical, that went up. Yes. The scores in this table on this page indicate that students in all grades, all grade levels, respond to spatial and bodily kinesthetic intelligences in their selection on the inventory. So this right here will tell you why the need for multiple intelligence in the classroom. So the next phase we're gonna go into is about the planning. How do I involve this in my lesson plan? And I know teachers, it's a lot to take in, but we can start by infusing a little bit of this multiple intelligences. I'm not here to tell you you gotta change your whole curriculum 
to make it this multiple intelligence uh, curriculum, but to infuse some of these things. So I'm gonna present you with the eight models here of lesson planning uh, ideas that you can use. And here we have the first intelligence as verbal linguistic intelligence. Here you can apply this in a history class, in a math class, in a language arts class, in a science and health, in global studies and geography, in practical arts and in fine arts. And you can take a look at some of these key strategies, key ideas for each of the intelligences that you see here. And I'm gonna scroll down to the next one. Mathematical logical intelligence. In a language arts class, predict what will happen next in a story or play. Create an outline with four main points by four sub points by four sub sub points. Here we have also visual spatial in a history class, a math class, again, through one, two, three, four, five, two to seven subject matters here we have in school. Next, lesson plan ideas, music rhythmic intelligence. In a math class, learn addition and subtraction by beating drums or by using beats. Two ones, two, two twos, four, two, three, six. It has a beat, yes? And students learn to remember things by using beat, which is what we would say are mnemonic devices in assisting in remembering things. Uh, in fine arts, practice impromptu music composition. In a history class, create a series of key dates in history by using rap. Next, bodily kinesthetic intelligence. In a history class, a math class again, add and subtract members to and from a group to learn about fractions. Yes, using the actual body. In geography, play physical movement games from another culture. Here you can also have lesson plan ideas on interpersonal intelligence. Here you have lesson plan ideas using intrapersonal intelligence. And last but not least, you have lesson plan ideas using the naturalist intelligence. So you have all these resources here now. So, but what does it mean? And I have a little short little skit here that I always do. And I tell this story all the time to my class and to groups that I, I have a dog named Rex. And I taught Rex how to whistle and talk. So I told my, my friends, I taught Rex how to whistle and talk. And they were wowed by what I told them. So I said, I'm gonna bring Rex in and I'm gonna show you. And they were like, oh yes, we are waiting. So I brought Rex in. So I said, come on Rex, come on. Okay, he's gonna whistle and talk. Go ahead Rex, whistle, talk. And my friends were looking at me and I said, hold on. Okay Rex, whistle and talk. And they're still looking at me and they were like, wow man, you lied to us. You told us you taught him how to whistle and talk. And to their amazement, I told them, yes, I taught him but I never said he learned it. So a lot of times that we say that I taught it, they must have learned it. And I just gave you an example how you can teach something. So we have to make sure that our students are learning. And how do we ensure that they're learning? Another example, a demonstration is, I would choose somebody from the audience who don't speak any Spanish, who doesn't speak any Spanish. And I would say to them, and this could be in an English class, a math class or whatever concept I'm teaching in any subject matter. And I would say, Oye, Juan, ven acá, recógeme papel de piso y ponme la basura. And they look at me, I still don't get it. So I would switch and go around to the other ear. Maybe I need to speak louder and raise my voice and talk in the other ears. Maybe they'll get it then. Oye, Juan, por favor, recoge papel de piso y ponme la basura. She doesn't get it. I put it on the board, visual learner. She doesn't get it. I have them communicate with their friends, cooperative learning still doesn't get it. But until I do this, I would take this garbage can and boil up a piece of paper, and I would say, Juan, por favor, recogeme papel de piso y pómele en la basura, and he would do it. Did I change my language? No, I didn't. So until we make comprehensible to the learner what we're teaching, then and only then, I believe that learning is taking place. So if I taught it, they must have learned it, doesn't hold true all the time. And I hope those two demonstrations will help you out a little bit as to why we need to use this 
multiple intelligence in our classroom. So the planning stage is here. We have an objective in our class. And to that objective, how can I involve bodily kinesthetic? How can I involve the whole body or use my hands, hands-on experience? Musical, how can I bring in music or environmental sounds or set key points in a rhythmic or melodic framework? Interpersonal, yes? How can I engage students in peer sharing, cooperative learning? Linguistic, how can I use the spoken word? Spatial, how can I use visual aids, visualization, color, art, or metaphor? Mathematical logical, how can I bring in numbers, calculations, logic classification? Naturalist, how can I incorporate living things or natural phenomenon? So here we have all the multiple intelligence and planning. How can I involve that in my objective? So one of the things I did was an example I'll show you. Now, I taught Spanish for 20 years in Day County Public School. So in teaching the Spanish alphabet, usually, traditionally, we would just give them the Spanish alphabet. We would say it in class, repetition over, and send them home to study it. And hopefully tomorrow when they come, they will know the 30 letters of the alphabet in Spanish. But this didn't sit too well because many students will come back and they'll be A, B, C, C, and then they get stuck. So I incorporated the musical intelligence, yes? How can I bring in music or environmental sound? Yes, and mnemonic devices to assist in learning Spanish. So I'll run through this a bit quickly so you can see. I would say the first column is my name. What's my name? ABCHD. Again, what's my name? ABCHD. The next column are set to rhythm. Ta, 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 ta. Again, ta, 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 ta. Then I add the words. E, F, G, H, E. Otra vez. E, F, G, H, E. So I would say to them, what's my first name? ABCHD. Say it again, ABCHD. Next column, E, F, G, H, E. Then the third column, this side will say JK, and then this side will say L, E, Y, M. Are we ready? Again, JK, L, E, Y, M, JK, L, E, Y, M, JK. And as soon as we do that a few times, they got a little beat, they got a little rhythm, and they start hotaka, L -E -A -Y -M -E, hotaka, and some of the students begin to dance and showcase. So we got those three columns done. I said, look, you've learned 15 letters of the alphabet already in less than five minutes. So the next two columns follow the same kind of beat, and it's sort of a syncopated beat. Ta 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 ta. Let's add the words. N -e N -e o -k -u. N -e N -e o -k -u. Next column. R R S T U. R R S T U. And the last column. B W X Y Y Z. So this is one way that I implement the musical intelligence in the objective for students to learn the letters of the Spanish alphabet. Another way you can use verbal. Yes, here are the South America, and I want students to know this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The nine countries in South America where Spanish is spoken predominantly. So I use the letters. Here we have V, and they will do the V sign, CEP, and you see I draw a line through that E, and I would ask the students, what does that line represent? And they would tell me the equator. So the equator is that country right there, which is Ecuador. So V, set, V, set, V, C, E, P, and then you have your A, B, C in the form of a triangle, and then you have your P and your U, and they both end in Y. So here we go, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, that represents this line right there. Peru, yes. Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. So given these exercises, given the resources and the summaries of the seven ways of teaching using activities, teaching materials, instructional strategies, can we now create or infuse this 
into any one of our subject matter in our, in our, in our classes. And here's an example. This is an upper level elementary, a history class. The objective is to assist students in understanding the conditions that led to the development of Rhode Island in early American history. Students will engage in one or more of the following activities each day during history period. So applying the linguistic intelligence, read the textbook, again, the traditional model. But here we can apply bodily kinesthetic. Let's role play the events surrounding the setting of Rhode Island. Musical and linguistic, create a song or a rap that describes the circumstances leading to the settling of Rhode Island. Have students compare the selling of Rhode Island to their own, to their need or desire to have something that belongs to them and no one else, and their willingness to confront authority to get it. The naturalists use the internet to identify information about the vegetation and the wildlife in the Rhode Island. So what does it look like on that planning sheet? It will look something like this. And this is a science class photosynthesis, so you have the resources here, the objective is here, and you can see how the learning activities will involve the linguistic, the visual spatial, the musical, and the intrapersonal. So can you now select a partner that maybe teaches the same course as you do, and now you're gonna work on planning a unit? Yes, you'll come up with a title, you'll give me the lesson objective, and from that objective, I would like to see one to each of the intelligences with an activity that the students can do that will show you, that they can show you that they understand the objective of that lesson by using the multiple intelligence. And that's how I would implement or infuse multiple intelligence in my classroom. So some pointers I would like to leave with you in that effective teaching if students know what they are to learn, you increase the chances that the students will learn. If a child is not learning the way you are teaching, then I believe you must teach in the way that the child learns. We learn how to do things by what? By doing the things we are learning how to do. Tell a child what to think and you make him a slave to your knowledge but teach that child how to think and you make all knowledge his slave. And the major reason for giving a test is to find out if the students have accomplished the objectives of the assignment, but also it is to show or to test the effectiveness of your instruction. The purpose of teaching is to help all students succeed, not to remind people or not to remind them continually that they our failures. And in closing, I just want to tell you thank you. And I want to say that I choose Howard Gardner's multiple intelligence uh, theory for its practical application in the classroom. I believe that through the use of the multiple intelligence that teachers will be able to do at least these six things. They, it will help them foster understanding of the learning process in each of our students. It will allow students to take a more active role in their education. It will provide a variety of approaches to learning. It will provide various individual and interactive activities. It will allow for the use of various assessment and it will provide assistance for the specific needs of our students. And in closing, I'm gonna leave you with this saying by Margaret Mead. If we are to achieve a richer culture, rich in contrasting values, we must recognize the whole gamut of human potentialities. And so we weave a less arbitrary social fabric, one in which each diverse human gift will find a fitting place. Thank you. And here's my information. My email address is there. So if you have any questions or you want me to send you any one of the slides that you see there in a sort of a paper form, I will be able to do that. Uh, my phone number is there, you can call me, that's my cell, or you can text. And my website is right there. You can send me a website anytime you feel like. Once again, thank you for your time.
and hope you enjoy this session on multiple intelligence.